change it, then that's fine. Is that doing it? Okay. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people. Um, my name's Laura Clancy. I'm the director of the Centre for Gender Studies at Lancaster University, um, and I've organised this series of seminars. Just to say that on Teams, there are auto captions available if you need them. Um, you can click on the three dots at the top and there's a scroll down and there's automatic captions. Um, if people can please just keep themselves muted and your cameras off just while um, which Emily's doing the presentation just because it takes up a lot of bandwidth um, and then when we get to the discussion part please feel free to turn your mic on or your camera on if you'd like to to ask a question. Um, so this is the first in our series of seminars on digital bodies is what we're calling it so this is linking into our feminist media media and cultural studies summer school really hard to say um at lancaster university that we do every other year um and the theme of that this year is on digital bodies so these seminars kind of lead up to that so this is thinking through a very broad topic um obviously but thinking through these various responses to that particular topic um we do have two more events coming up so the next one um i'm just going to put the links in the in the chat if anyone hasn't seen them so the next one will be uh, with Professor, La Professor Angela Jones on camming um, and the sex worker industry um, and kind of money and power and all of those questions. She's a really great speaker, so that'll be really nice. Um, and the third one is with Oscar um, Zhu, who's talking about gay sexualities on Douyin, so TikTok, the Chinese version of TikTok. Um, and we do actually have a fourth seminar coming up, so that's going to be Jamie Hakeem. He's going to be doing the keynote at the summer school and we're going to be making that a hybrid event. Um, so information will come out on that soon. Um, but firstly today, so we've got, I'm really pleased um, that Emily's agreed to do this, I think it'll be really interesting. So um, Emily Hoyle is a PhD researcher at Lancaster University at the intersection of gender studies and feminist science and technology studies. Her research is an examination of the reproduction of power relations in the transhumanist imaginaries with a specific focus on the entanglement of masculinity and technology. And the aim of her research is to gain a better understanding of how gender, race, sexuality, class, etc. are reproduced in imaginings of transhumanist futures. And she's also a contributing author to the DK publishing book Feminism Is and teaches, does really amazing teaching on um, gender and women's studies 101 um, in the sociology department. So this talk is called Upload, Fantasies of Self-Birthing and Reproductions of Masculinity. Emily's going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes and then we'll be able to open up to questions at the end. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. So I'm really happy to be here today. And as Laura's already introduced me, my name is Emily Hoyle. My pronouns are she and her. And the title of this seminar is Upload Fantasies of Self-Birthing and Reproductions of Masculinity. So if I talk too fast, do let me know. I have a tendency to do that. So just write in the chat and I will slow down. So just to sort of go over that a little bit again, um, I am a PhD researcher here in, in um, Lancaster University in the sociology department. So I'm in the centre of gender studies, but I'm also in the centre of science studies, and that will sort of make more sense um, in the talk today. And my thesis is an examination of how transhumanist imaginaries are also gender, race, sexuality and class in the making to gain a better understanding of how power relations are reproduced in imaginings of technoscientific futures. So today's seminar is part of a chapter of my thesis, so to help situate what I will be discussing today, I'm going to really quickly discuss transhumanism. So transhumanism is a collective imagining of a future when technology, technological enhancements or complete techno transcendence of the human biological body will be facilitated by science and technology. So I take transhumanism very seriously. So I in turn take the imagination seriously as collective material semiotic practices where figurations emerge. So today's seminar is part of the thinking of my thesis, and therefore I do argue that the Amazon Prime series Upload is a site where transhumanist imaginaries are reproduced and reimagined. So it's also situated in a particular historical socio-cultural position that I will be exploring today. So I'll discuss how science fiction films and TV depict masculine rebirthing and how male bodies are rebirthed 
through and by technology and as such a way to replace or subvert, subvert the room. So I widen this view to discuss how imaginaries of techno transcendence reproduce whiteness and masculinity through this concept of rebirthing that is situated in a racialized history of reproduction. So upload, it's a comedy series from Amazon Prime and so far it's only in its first series but Amazon have confirmed a second season. So Nathan Brown, the protagonist who you can see pictured here, he, his mortal body starts to die when he's involved in a car accident and his consciousness is uploaded into the virtual afterlife and he forms a romance with his handler who works for the service provider who manages the virtual afterlife he now inhabits. And the handler is called Nora and Angel, Nora being her given name and Angel being her handler's name. And we will meet them both later in the seminar because I'm gonna be focusing particularly when Nathan is uploaded. But first to understand uploading, we must discuss robotonist Hans Movex who popularized the fantasy of uploading. So in 1988, he published this book called Mind Children, and he envisioned this future where humans will free themselves from their bondage to a mortal body and upload themselves into shiny metal machines. And I ask that we pay attention to this language of disembodiment as freed from the bondage of a body. And this is an imagining of a post-flesh post -flesh future where human consciousness is downloading and uploading into the metal bodies of computers, personal immortality, immortality by mind transplant. So Movet's future, the so-called children of our minds, will be self-improving and reproducing. And according to him, that once machines exist in our culture that can evolve independently of human biology, humans will be rid of their limitations. Presumably he is talking about um, biological reproduction as a limitation. So in simple terms, can be understood as an imagining of artificial reproduction that relies on a high-tech view of the body as a cybernetic communication system. So writing on Mavec, Catherine Hales notes how he was not alone, but rather he was part of a cultural moment that believed that information can circulate unchanged among different materials. Hales argues information lost its body when intelligence became symbolic rather than enacted. So you might think of computer science language and how it's used to talk about the body, such as hack, hack, braid and optimize. In other words, it's a social cultural imagining of the human as only thought, only information and only data. Therefore, it can be circulated. So it merges a techno transcendence fantasy denies the corporal at the site of sensitivity. So Hales frames this erasure of the embodiment and importantly that this erasure is common to both the liberal human subject and the cybernetic post-human because the locus of the self lies inside the mind not in the body. So it's a bodiless consciousness as the self emerging from the enlightenment era that constructed the universal liberal subject as objective, rational and has a claim to knowledge Therefore, it was implicitly male and white. So Donna Haraway, in the Cyborg Manifesto, says that certain problematic dualisms have been persistent in Western traditions, such as self, other, mind and body, culture and nature, male, female, civilized, primitive, truth, illusion, total, partial, and God and man. And this is not a neutral demarcation, but rather that the primary term defines itself by expelling its subordinated other. So in Western philosophy, the body is an interference and a danger to the operation of reason from the superior rational mind. And Haraway argues these dualisms have been systemic to the logic and practices of domination of women, people of color, nature, workers, and animals. And this is the legacy of entitlement humanism as a drive to mastery. As Haraway notes, to be positioned as self is to be one, the master, the man, and the one God. So this is the unmarked position, and it's historically and socially culturally constituted through a history of science that's tied to militarization, capitalism, colonialism, Christianity, and male supremacy. 
So it's a claim to power to see and not be seen, to represent whilst escaping representation. So in other words, it's a constitution of Western science by the experimental method. Men were rendered invisible so they could report on facts without the being polluted by the body to give credibility to their descriptions of other bodies by minimizing critical attention, critical attention to their own. So gender is always relational. It's not predetermined, nor does it pertain more to women to men. Rather, it's being reproduced and remade. Similarly to disability, race, class, and sexuality are also relational. So as Haraway argues, the world of scientific gentlemen was instrumental in both sustaining old and crafting new gendered ways of life that the culture of science has not simply excluded women, but rather it's been defined in defiance of women through a masculine virtue of modesty of the mind. Historian Noble writes, Western science evolved only half human, a world without women. So the scientific revolution was a time when women and some men were persecuted as witches and therefore gentlemen sought to disassociate themselves with all things feminine including the alchemy traditions. And we continue to see this exclusion of the feminine and, from, and women from science and then technology, as the culture of engineering best exemplified by Freemasonry is defined through the exclusion and defiance of women. So as Noble writes, technology became the modern measure of elite masculine identity. And you could argue it remains so. Because if you work at any university, I recommend you go sit in the engineering building and count how many women you see. So Nima Pramoir writes, some bodies are deemed as having the right to belong, whilst others are marked out as trespassers, who are in accordance with how both spaces and bodies are imagined, politically, historically, and conceptually circumscribed as being out of place. So I really want to labor this point, that gender and race are relations that are made and remade through notions of unmarked and marked bodies, and in this history of Western philosophy and science, to inhabit the unmarked position is to be masculine and white because they are rendered invisible in these spaces. So whilst women may participate in the techno-science world, they cannot transcend. And Noble writes that although today's technologists in their pursuit of power and profit seem to set society's standard for rationality, we might wonder why technologies rarely seem to adequately meet our human and social needs and this is because on a deep cultural level, technologies had never been about meeting them, but rather they're aimed at the loftier goal of transcending such mortal concerns altogether. That are enchantment with all things technological, the very me measure of modern enlightenment is rooted in religious myth and ancient imaginings. So you might think of Silicon Valley or figures like Elon Musk who desire to colonize Mars for those who freeze themselves in the hope of one day being uploaded. Because I can't talk about uploading without talking about cryonics. So a real brief overview of cryonics is the practice of cryogenically freezing your body or your head in the hope of a future when technology can revive your consciousness and you will live immortal life as a machine or a cyborg. For me, it's a real stark example of the privileging of the mind as it's the belief that cryonics offer the chance to extend individual existence beyond the point of biological death. So patients predominantly choose to only freeze their head, sending their headless body off to be burning, off to be burnt in the process of freezing their brain. So despite burning their bodies, these patients are not constituted as dead, but rather suspended between life and death. And the fantasy uploading is a way in which these patients hope to be reanimated in the technological future. So cryonics and uploading are entangled together and they give us an insight into the reimagining of birth that is technological, wombless, individual, masculine and a reproduction of the self. So I turn to science fiction, not only as symbolic imaginings of these fantasies of self-birth, but also as sites of future making practices. So arguably, since Mary Shelley imagined Frankenstein's monster reanimated by electricity, in science fiction, we've encountered this trope of rebirth, not by the womb, but rather by techno-scientific machinery. So here are two examples, but there are plenty. The first one is the 2018 Netflix series Altered Carbon, where the human consciousness is transferred and uploaded between bodies to live as an immortal. 
and we see the male protagonist birth from a vacuum seal package as shown by the poster. And if you watch the trailer, you'll hear the narrator say, your body is not who you are. You shred it like a snake, shred its skin. So it's continuing this notion that the self is only in the mind, the consciousness. And then we have the 2014 film Transcendence, and the male protagonist, after being injured by a radioactive bullet, has his consciousness uploaded into the AI supercomputer super that he has created to be reborn as immortal. So in science fiction film, we encounter self-birth as technological, artificial and controlled, and the womb has either been replaced, erased or subverted. So the womb is a critical site for imagining in horror science fiction film, as birth is reimagined, as Barbara Creed famously theorised about Ridley Scott's alien, there are various representations of the birth scene and behind each lurks the figure of the archaic mother, that's what makes them scary, and the most obvious is the alien itself in its horrifying otherness also invokes the maternal. But the scenes I'd like to draw your attention to are pictured here. So the first is when the astronaut emerged slowly from their sleep pods. There's no blood, trauma or terror, and the human subject is fully born fully developed. The second is the astronaut Kane, who becomes pregnant after peering into the egg in the womb to investigate. And as Creed argues, he becomes part of the primal scene, taking place of the mother, the one who is penetrated, the one who bears the offspring of the union. So in heteronormative culture, when male bodies become grotesque, they then take on the characteristics associated with female bodies. So in this instance, the man's body becomes grotesque because of its capability of being penetrated. So later we see Cain die as out of his stomach, he births a monstrous alien. So in contrast to the clean, technological and peaceful rebirth of the astronauts, Cain's is a threatening, monstrous birth on the male body that is bloody and gory, and it's made to be repulsive to the audience. So other technological depictions of rebirth, we see in the 2014 film Robocop, which is the remake of the 80s classic, and the 1993 film Demolition Man. So both characters are police officers. Robocop's Alex Murphy is turned into a cyborg cop and Demolition Man Sergeant John Spartan is rebirthed from his cryo prison cell. So both films depict a futural utopian technological militarized police force you could argue that in itself is racialized, and their protagonists resemble the 1980s archetype of masculinity, with muscular physiques, strength and brute force. So Von Tasker, as in, inspired by the quite well-known work of Richard Dyer, highlights that muscles can function as both naturalizations of male power and dominance, as it evidence precisely of the labor that has gone into the production of that effect. So if we briefly consider Robocop, as Anne Blasimo argues, in contrast to female cycles that are culturally coded as emotional, sexual, and often naturally maternal, you might think of Ex Machina as an example of this over-sexualized, hyper-feminine cyborg. Male-gendered cyborgs fail to challenge the distinction between human and machine because Western culture imagination aligns masculinity and rationality with technology and science. And moreover, Kathleen Wolby argues that the male body is understood as phallic and imperitable, as a war body simultaneously armed and armoured, equipped for victory. So in science fiction, I would argue masculinity gets redefined and reproduced through not only the male body, but the male body that is reproduced by technology. Sorry, rebirthed by technology. So Harrow writes that reproduction is a central actor in high tech myth systems structuring our imagination a personal and social possibility. And radical feminist Shulamis Firestone in The Dialect of the Sex, written in 1970, argued for the elimination of the sex distinction. And Firestone believed that re artificial reproduction could facilitate the emancipation of women as the reproduction of the species would no longer bear solely on the female body, but rather through technoscience. However, reproduction technologies cannot so easily be disentangled from the racialized history of slavery, sexology, birth control, sterilization and eugenics. So writing on the reproductive politi politics in the 19th, Andrew Davis states that the United States in the first half of the 19th century, when the importation of, of Africans was made um, no longer legal, 
African women who were enslaved were imprisoned within their reproductive role as a reproduction of the labour force in the slave economy. So the slave economy denied motherhood for a vast number of African women. And at the same time, as C. Riley Snorton reminds us in his book, Black on Both Sides, the pelvis was a critical site for producing racial hierarchies among 19th century sexologists and intent on finding bodily proof of black inferiority. And this informed the field of, field of gynecology within America. So Snorton writes that the captive bodies were the raw material in the making of the field of women's medicine. So in other words, the Western techno science constructions of sex and gender is through a clinical gaze rooted in a history of misogyny and racism. This is important to understanding the body, poli body politics of artificial, artificial reproduction. So feminists have thought critically about what in vitro fertilization, otherwise known as IVF, surrogacy and inbro transplant might mean for the female body and for motherhood. Blasamo argues that the new reproductive technologies such as IVF enact the fragmentation of the female body through the isolation and intervention into the physical processes of human reproduction that would usually occur within the female body. So the concern is this entanglement of labour, capitalism and reproductive technologies. And as Emily Martin writes, if doctors are like the managers controlling the work that women's bodies do in birthing a baby, then what will stop short of actually removing the workforce, the women themselves? But importantly, as Angela Davis writes, the fragmentation of maternity, and we may argue the body, is only made more obvious by the new technological developments in reproduction as the economic systems of slavery fundamentally relied upon the alienation and fragmentation of maternities. Therefore, Davis employs these terms made possible by new reproductive technologies such as birth mother, genetic mother and surrogate mother as retroactive descriptions for the statuses of women who were enslaved because of the economic appropriation of their reproductive capacity reflected by the inability of the slave economy to produce its own labour force. So I argue we cannot understand reproductive technologies without making visible the racist, ableist and classist histories of reproduction politics. And we should be cautious about how eugenics persists in notions of artificial reproduction. But IVF, embryo transplant and surrogacy are enacted through social economic conditions that are situated in time and space. So Dave, David Noble argues that the new technologies of reproduction and genetics have also brought us close to the ancient fantasy of man being born without a natural mother. That IVF and embryo transplant are one step towards the artificial womb, a womb for men. That after a thousand years, the obsessive scientific pursuit of a motherless child remains the telltale preoccupation of a womanless world. So we see this pursuit enacted in robotics in projects of artificial intelligence and in the fantasy uploading. And Haraway notes, Doctrines of masculine self-production have impressed thinkers in the West for many centuries and mutations on this theme proliferate in cyberspace and in many other techno-scientific rooms. So the self-birthing of man is deeply entrenched in West Western philosophy and science. We mustn't forget that the male god only created Adam in his own image, not Eve. And the seed program of artificial life and the composite of the human genome would also informally be called Adam. So the pursuit of techno transcendence in the hope of immortality is, I argue, a masculine self-birthing fantasy that erases or replaces the womb. So we're now going to watch upload. Hopefully it will play. <laughs> 
Okay, so there's a few things I'd like to draw your attention to. So, Nathan is a computer engineer and gamer. He's young, white, male, Christian with a lean physique. And I argue audiences that inhabit these same characteristics are invited to see themselves in Nathan. But Nathan is in threat, not from the upload, but rather from his girlfriend, who is an interference in his independence and his ability to make a rational choice that comically he wants to discuss with his mother. So it's worth mentioning in the cryonics community, there's often talk about divorce as wives pose a threat to the possibility of being frozen as they might not hand over the body. So uploading is frequently idolized in this series, but Nathan is burdened by his in his new life by his mortal relationship with Ingrid. However, his relationship with his service provider, Angel Nora, develops as it takes place in the virtual. And Angel, we can briefly see here, is feminized by and through the act of service. And Nathan is frequently only hears her voice, like we might hear Siri or Alexa. But to take you back to the upload scene in particular, so Nathan is uploaded virtually with no blood or mess and his now useless headless body falls into an ice bath. So the, room, the womb is replaced with a laser beam and Nathan is reborn adult and as information. So Angel says, I want you to think of yourself. I think therefore I am. And again, we see the self as the mind. So what makes Upload particularly significant in the genre of science fiction? It's not the masculine action hero of the 1980s with the muscular physique that we've seen in Robocop. Well, the troubled hero arises to leadership through the rational control over emotions. Rather, Nathan is more in line with what Ben Little and Alison Winch conceptualised in their book, The New Patriarchs of Digital Capitalism, as a new, genera new generation of entrepreneurial geek masculinity. At its most stereotypically extreme, these characters appear as zebral, wounded by earlier trauma, emotionally incapable rather than repressed, and they are armed with computer engineering expertise rather than the mechanical or martial skills. So instead of performing often violent, moral correct action to defeat adversities, these heroes outthink their opponents, manipulate the system, or find loop loopholes to enable them to win. So like previous variants of hegemonic masculinity, these forms of geek or hacker heroism augurate a social order where they dominate. Now, I do take caution with the idea of new, new masculinities. Rather, I would argue this is a reimagining and reproduction of whiteness and masculinity that is very much rooted in a historical and social culture imagining of techno science. So science fiction engages us in future possibilities. In other words, you better believe it because this is really coming. And the film scholar David A. Kirby argues science fiction film can be productions of virtual witnessing as filmmakers, scientists and engineers work together to infuse the audience to future techno science as plausible realities. Therefore, we might argue that masculine fantasies of rebirth in science fiction film and TV are not mere coincidences, but an assemblage of future making practices that work as a continuation of a techno science culture that reproduces and remakes gender and race through a history of mastery, rationality and control. So if these are the digital bodies of the future, will you be uploading? And thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and just to show, these are my references from today as well. Thank you, Emma. That was great. Every time you I talk, we talk about your research, I come out like mind blown <laughs> with the, some of the connections you make. I think it's just amazing. Um, if anyone's got any questions, you can feel free to stick your hand up, turn your camera on, or you can put them in the chat, um, whatever you feel is comfortable with. Um, might take people a few minutes to formulate a question, possibly, <laughs> which is fine. Oh, Teresa, would you like to come on? Um, yeah, should I put my camera on or just leave it? It's up to you. I don't mind. Um, I've got my thing up. I'm, I'm really interested in this idea about um, the kind of person they are and the values that they have, because in many ways for me, I think upload becomes a kind of form of redemption of character. 
the way it does in, in many other recent examples. So, um, you know, he decides that he won't be part of the elite program, elite, you know, say program in the end of the first series. And there's a kind of redemptive element to losing the body as well. So I wondered what you thought about that idea. So it's not a kind of fixed identity that is transposed into data. It's actually so in some ways frees or liberates um, and makes it kind of possible to think about the self in a different way. So I don't I wonder what you thought about that. I thought that was, you know, something that that'd be good to um, to know your thoughts on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And I do think that redemption is part of the transcendence imaginary um, because it's rooted in also Christian ideas of redemption as well. So it's tied into that idea of transcending the self and becoming a better self. Um, I'm trying to think less about perhaps personal identities and thinking more about relations in particular and how the self is defined as masculine. Um, so how that might how that might change his engagement with masculinity. I'm not sure it's not necessarily, um, identities aren't necessarily my area, but I do think that yes, redemption is part of this and re re redemption is the promise of upload in particular. Do you think that redemption feeds into other kind of, you know, you mentioned at the beginning like these different representations, representations of transhumanism. Do you think that that features in those or do you think that's unique to this? It's Sorry. honestly, okay. yeah, it's it's a hard it's hard to say. I think that um I believe that yes, I think there's a, a ambition of these techno science imaginaries to be redeemed through them. But that re redemption is is particularly Christian. So Mm. whether it's achievable or not or, or what that actually means I'm kind of reluctant to try and think that that there's a change particularly within the notion of transcendence and rather that actually these masculinities ch actually stay the same within them too mm. um, but there's a there's um it's like I try to think it's like almost masculinity is on the move they're trying to say that they're moving away from masculinity by transcending but actually um if you if you see how transhumans talk about it it's as if masculinity won't exist, but it very much is enacted in other ways. Yeah, lovely. OK. Hannah, do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. Um, so I have a question about, um, so you talk about, um, I found it really interesting when you talked about Frankenstein and how that like reproduced that masculinity because you show that it's historical. I have a question about how masculinity is reproduced through like kind of cultural anxieties. And you talk about that like today in Silicon Valley and um, Elon Musk so how even though you say it's relational but how does that like reproduce like different like class and gender and races like in maybe in relation to like climate change and like this kind of like fear of technology which was happened in the Victorian era when Mary Shelley written like Frankenstein so how is that kind of like mirrored or like reproduced? Yeah so um, I feel like I could do a, a separate <laughs> talk about this but I would say is in relation to the zombie figure um, so we can think about that in relation to um, it is about the body and it is about the mind in relation to the body and a, per a perception of the body um, not breaking its boundaries, which we see in the zombie figure. And Frankenstein represents that threat because it's monstrous and because it is of the body. And that's why Frankenstein's monster is, is the threatening self to Victor. So we can see that in, in particular through um, the quantified self, for example, how people monitor themselves in order to have readable, controlled information. And there's an absolute desire in Silicon Valley to achieve immortality. So the expelling of, it's in relation to the other because it's in expelling of the body. So when I talk about marked bodies, I'm talking about those bodies that are classed and are racialized and gendered as well. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's very much kind of thinking about the mind versus the body and trying not to, Silicon Valley is very much about trying not to break bodily boundaries, so really having control and mastery around the body. So those who don't have that are, um, are othered. Can I ask you, so I'm going to, uh, I can see a few people typing, but while they do that, um, 
I'd be so interested to hear what you think. You mentioned briefly in there the whole space race thing that's going on at the moment. I just I, I find it quite fascinating. I'd I'd love to hear what what you think of that in relation to this or generally or. Yeah, so I think the space race is part is very much part of kind of what I was talking about um, about this kind of why doesn't technology um, serve social need? Um, you know supposed to be pinnacles of rationality but the space race doesn't serve social need and it is about because it's about transcendence um, and how that really is sort of tied into reproducing of an elite masculine and white identity um, I think like the first manned um, space um, space vehicle American one was called Adam so it's a reproduction of sort of the um, transcendence goal that has existed in in Christianity and then was taken up in science and technology as well so it's really is about kind of being the the one being the god taking in the unmarked position all the time and a reproduction of that lovely yeah and I mean it's so interesting that so many of the kind of the rockets the the shape of them is so phallic <laughs> and like how that kind of link I think that links in really well to the stuff you were talking about about that kind of visualization of masculinity through technology yeah because and then it's the it's kind of like the imperitable phallic isn't it as well so the bodies and they are not penetrating they are the ones who penetrate so they can do the symbolic masculinity yeah lovely yeah uh, Mark you've got your hand up hi thank you thank, I mean uh, thanks Emily that's absolutely fascinating and I'm, I'm I've got the problem I think Laura alludes to the beginning I'm struggling to formulate a question quite but it, but it was something to do with um you're, you talk about kind of new masculinities and and just thinking about uh, trying to I, I agree with you, I'm not sure this is new masculinity but but, but also thinking what, what is new so it feels like a lot of what you're talking about is is a different was a kind of different version of the same it's still relational it's still um it, it's still um heterosexual I think in that it seemed to be saying that it's still about trying to for, for men to try and live up to a to an unattainable ideal it's all those things so, so I'd be interested to see what your thought is about what it is that's new or what perhaps new directions it might take us in thinking about masculinities yeah great thank you so yeah so as I said I'm sort of reluctant with um, new masculinities I think we've had quite a few I think we can kind of think about new if we think about um, perhaps um, the dominant representations we start seeing in sci-fi. I think Upload is an in particularly interesting one because it's a move away from action science fiction or horror science fiction we've always seen. It's kind of romantic comedy. Um, so that's interesting. So we can maybe think about new masculinity, masculinity in media and culture, but yeah, I'm, I'm reluctant with new because it does feel like it's a reproduction of masculinity that um, is capable of change. Um, but it's also rooted in socialization um, that extends very far back, in particular thinking about um, the scientific revolution as well. So one particular thing that does come to mind is um, Donna Haraway was talking about the modest witness. So talking about how modesty, um, so whilst they were heterosexual, that kind of sexuality was sort of um, left out of the lab. Um, so you know, was very much about modesty and not um, talking about sex or engaging in sex at all. We kind of see a change in that. Um, Maureen McNeil kind of notes that we get this kind of more scientific hero come through who is more um, heterosexual and sort of embodies that a lot more. Um, and then you might, you, we can kind of think of tech um, tech figures like um, Elon Musk who do embody that um, heterosexual sexuality very differently to a modest witness. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is that feels like a substantial change, even though it's not particularly that obvious. It stays the same. Um, I think if you look at if you're kind of interested as well, if you look at cryonics, um, Max Moore, who runs Alcor, he often dresses in like leather pants. So there's like an insertion of masculinity that is slightly different to the scientists that we saw in the 18th century. Absolutely. Mm. Um, yes, I'm reluctant to say new, but maybe. <coughs> No, thank you. And that's, I think that's really interesting. Just a, it's a very slight sort of completely out of interest in in upload. Are there older men's bodies in there as well? Or is it I mean, is it are we, is there something to hear about age as well? So yeah, a so, six so, year old man. For, uh... 
Yeah, there was a little bit at the end I didn't include. So it's interesting because Angel says it's open to all ages, religions and genders, forgetting that, um, you know, there is a cost to this, but also kind of the um, the way it's presented to an audience. I believe it's for a younger audience and therefore, no, we're not seeing these older bullies. Because also age is a threat to transhumanism. <laughs> so, you know, they don't want to age. Seeing the body change in that way is the threat. So being young is the desire. Thank you, that's great. Anyone else want to ask any questions? I've got one, but I don't want to keep abusing my chair's privilege. <laughs> Um, Anuja? Um, hi, thank you so much uh, for your talk, Emily. Your project is absolutely uh, fascinating and um, it's incredible to see the work that you've done um, at a PhD level. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, my question is really around um, whether you have considered um, the backstage of your um, context or example, right, which is upload. Um, so thinking about uh, Greg Daniels, who is the producer writer of the show, um, because from just um, following his work, what I've noticed is Greg Daniels does tend to reproduce masculinity, but repackages it in a way that seems more updated almost um, more contemporary but then when you actually analyze um, his work whether that's you know the office or upload um, or space force now it seems that he's just reproducing those same masculinities on screen um, and um, I was wondering if that plays any role in your research at all. Great, thank you so I'm really focusing particularly around sort of um, that upload scene in particular but I do think, yes, what I find really interesting about Greg Daniels' work is how he's reproducing his masculinities, but through comedy. Um, and I think that's interesting. I've, I haven't really got a solidified point on it, but I do think this is a more um, friendlier um, and desirable engagement for an audience that can engage in this in sort of a less threatening way, which actually could be perhaps more powerful, we might argue. Um, you know, if we are engaging in sci-fi this way, that is more comical. And I believe there was going to be a film release of Cryonics that was going to be a comedy. So if we engage with transhumanism in a comedy way, does it actually become more um, taken more seriously? Does it become more desirable? I think there is something interesting about that. And um, so because we can see transhumanism um, is sort of we, transhumanist imaginaries are producing so many different sites. So yeah, I, I don't have a complete point, but I do think it is interesting, particularly around comedy. Like you're saying, it's sort of this idea that, oh, this is a friendlier masculinity, but actually it's actually a reproduction of masculinity we've already seen. We maybe just have a more perception to them as an audience that we enjoy them more. Thank you. Thank you, some really good questions coming up. Anyone else? I just wonder if I could quickly uh, ask, is there a way back for the Enlightenment project um, in your reading with this? Or, um, and also, is there sometimes, I wonder if you've seen the, the, the programme, uh, This Is Up or whatever, with Leonardo DiCaprio, who's on Netflix at Christmas. Um, there was an Elon Musk character in this, um, but he was a sort of parody of um, uh, wish fulfillment, superstition, really conflated with rationality. Um, I think that ties in with my question is, do you think there's a place for uh, reason and uh, Descartes um, <laughs> cog cogito in, in the 21st century, I guess? I thought I might get a question about Enlightenment era. Um, I think I think the interruptions into um, Enlightenment era humanism um, and the binaries in particular is 
I don't particularly have uh, an answer for this, but I think flesh is really important. Our understandings of flesh are really important, what flesh is, what the body is. Um, I also think there's ways of interrupting these ideas of future through um, Afrofuturism as well. Um, so looking at what other writers do around sci-fi, I think are really important. Um, so even when we see kind of, I think to the earlier point is, it's kind of interesting this as well, like um, what Greg Daniels is doing and what Don't Look Up do. Okay, right, they're now doing it comical, but are there actually other imaginings of sci-fi that we could be engaging with as, with, as audiences? You know, um, particularly looking at the work of um, uh, trans writers, they look at the body very differently um, in science fiction, which I think are really interesting, and they play with ideas of contagion that are a lot more enjoyable um, than, and then less threatening than what we see. Um, in these dominant kind of ideas. So yes, I'm, I'm hopeful there is a way back, but I do think it's, it is about interventions into this knowledge production and thinking of other, other ways of producing knowledge um, and also other imaginings, other techno science imaginings of the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Ther Therese, have you got your hand up? Yeah, I was just thinking about in terms of a critique of this kind of approach, I would have thought the good place would have been sort of the, the uh, text in a sense, in terms of that idea of uh, an exploration of philosophical uh, treaties which mask the um, issues related to the body. And then the strange reveal of the main, one of the main characters, uh, the shirt off reveal moment. And it's a kind of a really interesting, you know, dichotomy there. And basically, um, you know, she has to be taught. She's taught how to think. She's taught how to think, I think about the world in a particular way, in a philosophical way, basically introduced to the Enlightenment, really, in a sense. Um, and I think that's such a, it's a really interesting program in those terms because of that relationship between the body and mind and a lot of what they talk about is actually that relationship between the body and mind um, so you know and many other examples too as well but I you know I'd be interested to to know perhaps uh, you know in in general whether that forms part of your analysis in relation to upload I would imagine so um, but yeah I, I think that's just an interesting one in terms of some of the things that you said so Great, thank you. I haven't actually watched Good Life, so I will watch it and um, perhaps it will become part of my analysis. So thank you. You'd like that, Emily. Yeah. You'd really like it. It's a good show. <laughs> I'll be watching it. And fun as well. It's a fun watch. It's not a hard watch. Anyone else with a question? That's some really good questions. I was wondering about the role of, and you can, if you kind of don't have this data or this analysis, please just say. I wondered about the link to kind of ideas of colonisation. Um, and sorry, I'm going back to the space race again, but that, that's very much about colonisation, isn't it? And I just wonder how much kind of the rest of, you know, this idea of kind of techno science and masculinity and all of these things, how, how to what extent do you think they link to those ideas of kind of of, of colonizing power and, and masculine power in that kind of way? Um, yeah, so I so my MA so my MA dissertation, I looked at cryonics um, in comparison to um, the Walking Dead in particular, thinking about zombies. And um, zombies are very much rooted in colonization um, and you can look at 1930s, um, 1930s films that were coming out, these kind of like colonial, um, colonial propaganda and their texts as well, um, figured the savage as a zombie. So we get these figurations in colonialism of the zombie um, and it was about um, justification for colonisation um, of being civilised, of being rational mind and seeing the other was really reduced to the body um, and in particular sort of this contagious body as well, this myth mythological body. And if you look at kind of like around that 1930s, um, 1930s films, how you see the monster in particular and how that is figured as a racialized other. Um, I mean, it still happens, you know, people can say it happens in Lord of the Rings. It's quite a, a frequent thing that you'll see. Um, so 
this so the kind of cryonic self this rational self that will be sort of reborn is um produced and constituted through the othering of the colonial other they do exist together um and if you look at kind of texts in particular around cryonics they talk about why are they not zombies you know why are cryonics bodies not zombies and i think that that you know question remains it's a work and it's a practice that always has to be done in order to separate it. So you can think about um, how they call the bodies suspended. They're not dead. You know, they're not coming back to life. And they're really trying to separate themselves from the racialized other, the zombie, all the time. And um, so you, I do think you can almost not really consider something like the space race without considering colonialism, but also it very much is, again, it's always about escaping the body. Um, and it's always about escaping the kind of threat of the other, the threat of the body will kind of um, rot away. Great, really nice answer. Any last questions before we finish up? No, I think well, we're right on time. So I think, thank you so much, Emily. That was just brilliant it's always brilliant to hear you talk about your research I think it's fascinating and some of the connections you make are, are really um, amazing and I look forward to hearing more when you've done a little bit more as well and hearing more about the rest of the PhD um, so thank you so much for coming everybody thank you so much for great questions um, please do come back for the other talks um, in the series if you're interested um, so yeah thank you thank you very much Emily thank for talking thank you for your questions thank, thank you, you. The recording will hopefully be on you put on YouTube in answer to Priya. Oh, I'm going to make a YouTube for it. So if you look out on the Centre for Gender Studies Twitter and stuff, it'll be on there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.